the Full Disclosure Show here on the Restoring the Faith channel. I'm Mike. And I'm Joe. This is a show dedicated exclusively to bringing you up close and personal with notable authors, speakers, broadcasters of various academic uh, media, and even ecclesiastical backgrounds so that you can learn more about their personal story. We encourage our viewers to please subscribe to this channel, click the bell, and share this uh, channel with your family and friends. The faster this channel grows, the more content we can bring you. This show is designed to be an intimate and informative, up-close and personal look with the men and women who are behind the pen, and in this case today, behind the microphone. It, no, it goes without saying that the opinions expressed by the guests on the Full Disclosure Show do not always align perfectly with the opinions of Restoring the Faith Media. If you want to hear more about what we think, Mike and Joe, as well as the rest of the Restoring the Faith family, you can subscribe to the channel, check out our Living the Faith show, which comes out every week, um, and subscribe to the channel. Um, but that disclosure doesn't necessarily apply today because we got another mic on the show. Today, all mics are the same. All mics are the same. And today, our <laughs> special guest is Mike Church, founder of the Crusade Channel and host of the Mike Church Show, where he has been generously dispensing red pills since 1992. How are 1992. you, sir? I'm, I'm, I'm well. Thank you very much. And... Um, by the time we're finished, you will agree with everything I say. <laughs> okay, Mike. I, we're I, already there. <laughs> Mike, Mike I, I know the first thing that's going to catch everybody's eye is that badge that you seem to wear on all of your shows. What's the badge? Okay, so you're referring to this. So this is my daily devotion to the Holy Martyrs of the Vendée. And if you don't know the story of the Holy Martyrs of the Vendée, um... According to historians like the very respectable Joe, um, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, I think it's Joseph Doyle, or his last name is Doyle, wrote for the Oxford Press, the uh, Oxford Press Dictionary uh, uh, History of the French Revolution. He puts the genocide, he calls it a genocide, he puts the death toll at a quarter of a million. Wow. And, um, and most people don't know that. They know a little bit about the French Revolution. They know a little bit about the guillotine. They know a little bit about a, co a couple of Carmelite sisters that may have had their heads whacked off. They don't know anything about the Vendée. Yeah. The Vendée is a holy region in France. I've actually been there. And because um, if you know anything about the, the Vendée and about the French Revolution, the French Revolution was the first Masonic revolt. It was deadly. It was lethal. It was a genocide. And it was not designed for fraternité, égalité, liberté. Stupidité. It was, <laughs> yes, yeah, stupidité. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was brought forth and it was executed to eliminate the Catholic Church in France. Wow. And the people that, that did not go along with it were called non, they, they had priests that were called non juring priests. Well, everyone in the Vendée said, nope, not going to do it. So at first, the, uh, the, the French Republican Army was satisfied with just keeping them away from everyone else. But ultimately, it's just like we see today with the transsexual movement and castration and mutilation of seven-year-olds. We don't want you to just you know, be over there in a laissez-faire. We want you to endorse. We want you to fully accept. And if you don't fully accept, we're going to force you to fully accept. And so the people of Vendée said no. So the Republican army starts to move in. They, uh, they uh, had some colonels and generals that used to be officers in the French, in the French army. And they made them, Jacques Telleno is one of them. They made Jacques Telleno one of their leaders. And uh, they went to war. And uh, in the first days of, the, of, the, battle of uh, the battles in the Vendée, the Vendéans were winning. And they had repelled the, uh, they had repelled the French Republic, the, the Blues, as they go, the Blues, the Blues, the, the Blues, as they called them. They had repelled them, chased them almost all the way back to Paris. Now, if they would have pursued them, they could have ended the, the French Revolution and the war right then and there. But instead, they did what Catholics do. They went, okay, they're not going to bother us anymore. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake, because at that time, then, you get the order from the French Republican Congress uh, telling the general that was there, 
I want you to go through every village in the Vendée and I want you to kill all of them. And the general says, no way. Unless you put that in writing and you pass it in the Congress, I won't do it unless you do that. Well, they d- that's what they did. So they went through and they just started slaughtering. So this, the Holy Martyrs of the Vendée, there are approximately 140 women and children mainly that were herded up by the French Republican Army into a church and burned alive. Um, I believe it was uh, St. John Paul II that finally acknowledged them as holy martyrs. And uh, so the recognition of the uh, the holy martyrs of the Vendée can begin. But the reason I wear it is to get people like you to ask me. Because <laughs> what, we, what we need to happen is the genocide in the Vendée needs to be accepted by the international bodies, and we need to start with The Hague. If The Hague accepts it, as they ultimately have to, because it happened and it's true, well, guess who comes out of, politically speaking, guess who comes out of the smoldering ashes of the French Revolution? Marx, Engel. That's right. All, the socialist. Yep. Do you know that there's a village in, uh, in Soviet Russia that Lenin called Little Vendée? Hmm. That le- yes, that Lenin used the example of what was done in France as the example and as a model for the Bolshevik Revolution. But Mike, so, we're always told about how peaceful and uh, enlightened these uh, so-called rationalists were and that, that both the French and American revolutions are based on this idea of freedom and equality and fraternity and liberty. How could this happen? Well, because this is what the Masons use. You know, they, use uh, they use names, they use words. They uh, nominalism, right? They change the they change the meaning of things. So you could say liberty is a true liberty. You could say fraternity is a true Catholic solidarity fraternity. You could say uh, egalitarianism. Are you really uh, charity? Is it really charitable? Mm. And of course, the answer to all three is no. And they've continued to this day. They use words like pro-choice, <laughs> Roll woman's right to choose, gay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All that alternative lifestyles. Um, wow. Okay. So, have you seen Mike? Have you seen this docudrama called A Hidden Rebellion? Not only have I seen it, but Daniel Robidon has actually been right here, over there, <laughs> <laughs> and I've interviewed him. He stayed at my house, and uh, I've helped promote the film. That's it's fantastic. A great film. Everyone should watch it. It is a great film, and uh, we have that in common. He stayed at my house as well when we lived in L.A., and he was promoting the film. So uh, Daniel Rabadon will be on the Full Disclosure Show in the coming weeks, so stand by for that. Um, okay, so we've talked about the Vendée. Mike, you have been doing this for a while, man. You are a pro. I've... We, Joseph and I were doing our show prep, and we said, we're going to get four questions in with Mike Church. <laughs> <laughs> so we've really got to write them out. <laughs> because he's a big, uh, as uh, Jackie Gleason used to say on the uh, Honeymooner show, he's a blabbermouth. <laughs> <laughs> so the Crusade Channel, tell us about the Crusade Channel uh, and, and, everything, and all your work and what you primarily focus on. Well, the Crusade Channel is a, uh, uh, first thing people need to know, it's a radio station. This is not a podcast. We show up some days outlet here because we feel like it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It takes an extraordinary commitment to do that. And we actually started working on the nuts and bolts and the technologies that we would need to make the Crusade Channel going all the way back to like 2010 in the Tea Party days. So on certain holidays, like 4th of July, Constitution Day, we would do live uh, broadcast of some of our docudramas and documentaries and stuff. Yeah. Um, so that kind of laid the groundwork. So when Sirius XM Satellite Radio, after 13 years, decided it was not going to renew my contract, which I knew was coming. I, kept, I was expecting it the last three, four years. I was like, they're going to pull the plug, man. I know they're going to pull the plug. One more Chris Ferrara appearance, they're going to pull the plug. So um, we, were, we were waiting for him. We were ready for it. And uh, the only thing we didn't have was, what are you going to call it? Um, you're going to call it... Because uh, uh, we started with the Veritas Radio Network. 
That turned into, well, it can't be a network and be the show or the channel. So for two years, it was the Veritas Radio Network. And then for two years, for the last three years, going on four now, it's been the Crusade Channel and uh, at crusadechannel.com. So what it is is, and our goal is, because we are for profit. We're not nonprofit. Um, I talk a little bit about that later. But what we do is, and what our goal is, is to invade the space that has been almost completely consumed by major corporate media that puts out um, not very good radio uh, uh, and television broadcasts, but certainly radio, especially talk radio. Um, if you're not in the talk radio mafia, you probably don't have an entry point into it. They've killed local radio. They've killed any form of solidarity that you might have gotten because you could work for a mom and pop radio station. But the worst thing that they've done is they've normalized softcore porn. And they normalize it through all the music that they play, which is just simply diabolical. And then the rarity that you get a talk show that anyone could talk about this, again, if it's if it has any longevity to it, it's probably going to be syndicated. The syndicated guys, with all due respect, are all sellouts. They can't do what we do because we're subscriber based. So what we do, and it is a crusade, and I hope people want to join it. We're going to go into their markets, up against them, and fight them hand-to-hand -hand combat or mouth-to-mouth -mouth combat, ear-to-ear -ear combat, <laughs> and actually fight to take that space back for the good, the true, and the beautiful. You And we do politics. We are not church militant. We are not Taylor Marshall. Yeah. We are not Catholic by definition, and we never will be. And if we do, then that will be a nonprofit that will be run hopefully by a priest. Because mm -hmm. I think that's who should be doing that anyway. So what, what people need to understand then is you are speaking to a secular audience from the perspective of a Catholic. Now, our audience is probably over 50% Catholic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's a long story, guys. You Do you want the other three questions? <laughs> <laughs> bullet points, Mike. Bullet points. <laughs> so let me, let me give you the bullet point. Please. Uh. I'll try to be as kind as I can and not name any names. Oh, we can name names here on full disclosure. The trad wars. <laughs> I fought for three years okay. in the trad wars. Okay. I feel like I'm in a Star Wars movie now. Do you have, do, do, in, do, you have the combat trad. action ribbon from, uh, from your trad wars. <laughs> you have battle scars. You go into I bars have, and show people your scars and talk uh, about the days of the trad wars. I have scars, but they're not scars like that. But uh, <laughs> I fought in the trad wars, and I fought for almost three years in the trad wars. Uh, and there are some good people in the trad wars. There's also a bunch of petty egomaniacs. And there is this, uh, as Father Zulsdorf describes it, as this clown car mentality of everybody staking out a little piece of turf and, uh, and defending it to the end. And, uh, well, I can't do that with him because someone in my audience they may decide to stop with being with me, and I'm going to lose a donor because of him. So uh, you have this clash of egos. You have this zero-sum game, which I don't know why people think this, that are Catholics, because that is totally n not in keeping with a, a system of solidarity and then practicing it using subsidiarity. It just simply isn't. You can have competition and not wish to kill the other guy. And I thought that in the Catholic world that's the way it ought to be, but alas, it's not. So this is the trad war. I'm in my little corner here. I've got my fiefdom, and I'm going to defend it. I'm going to pretend as though, oh, hey, we recognize you, but we're not allowed to say your name. Oh, hey, we recognize you, and could you interview our person, but we're not allowed to say your name. Oh, hey. And there's just more of this pettiness, and it is truly petty. Um, and as Father Zulstorff describes it, you have all these guys and gals that are competing for this very small pie. It's a very, very small pie. I had a friend that described it as quite possibly the smallest demographic in the history of demographics. And instead of working with one another and instead of actually being in solidarity and true solidarity and subsidiarity, they just, we just pass by or they just pass by one another in the clown car with the bottle of seltzer water and go, ha ha, gotcha. Uh, I quit the trad wars in December of this year. I finished it last year out, rather, and then decided, you know what? 
It's not expanding our audience. I really am not, to, uh, we're not getting anywhere for the people that are invested in this. Um, and we're not seeing conversions anymore. It's not fun to me to talk to choirs. I think it's fun to talk to people that aren't Catholics too. I could talk to Catholics, I love doing it, but yeah. it's just as much uh, fun and a challenge to me. And I think part of you know what every Catholic ought to have, every Christian ought to have, you know, is that kind of apostolic zeal mm. uh, to want to go out and, uh, and, and, uh, and to be out there and among them. And uh, to tell you the truth, you know, President Trump has kind of drawn me back in to the old um, political wars, but I just see them through a totally different Thomistic uh, lens now than I ever did before. Mm. Um, and I think that that voice is needed. And I would encourage more people into trad wars. Get out. Get back into the public. Get into public affairs. Get into where people, what, what the people that need conversion, what are they talking about? I assure you, they are not talking about Ann Barnhart versus Chris Ferrara. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah, Mike, it, it, this is really interesting that you're talking about this because you're talking about going into the public public, right? You're just talking to whomever will will listen to your show and with the oculus of truth, which is what is Catholic, right? All, all that is true is Catholic. And you're representing, um, you know, main, uh, uh, not mainstream media, but uh, a, an alternative to m mainstream media where people look at things objectively and like reporters used to. Half, or, or were obliged to uh, to look at things, but uh, you and I had the good fortune of of meeting uh, as well as 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 Mike uh, several uh, months ago last year, um, and at a conference at a, at a conference in the heart of America. <laughs> conference in the heart of America. We'll leave it at well, that. Okay. <laughs> and um, an unnamed conference. An unnamed conference. Anyways, you were talking about this um, this oath that you want uh, to get people on board with, with regards to uh, chivalry in the media, which all, almost sounds like to wow. juxtapose. You are so old school, Mike. Yeah, Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah. Okay, so now this would be the nonprofit part of what we would do. So the chivalry in media oath is basically an Augustinian creed. And what you're basically pledging to do is treat what you do as a vocation, something that you love, and a calling, vocation, to be called, okay? Um, and to treat it as something that you love, not something that you get wealthy by. You know, the true wealth uh, in this life uh, is not really, doesn't come in the form of dollars and dineros. The true wealth comes in the form of Christian brotherhood, charity, those, you know, theological virtues. So the knight that's going to take the chivalry and media oath is going to be someone who's going to actually practice the ancient art of, I mean, dare I say, how, how, who would want to do this? Ethics. We should have broadcasting ethics. And, uh, and one of the ethical things that we should do is we should always do due diligence, and we should always consider, even in a secular setting, am I offending God? Am I offending religion? Am I leading anyone away from the faith or from religion? Now, I don't have to lead them to it, but am I doing something in my secular reporting that's going to lead them away from it? That's being a party to someone else's sin. And an ethical knight can't do that. So the crusader knight is always going to also going to take pledges um, that you're not going to see Mike Church in public, and I don't care what day of the week it is, bumming around with my supersized Frito-Lay <clears throat> colored toenails sticking out of a pair of flip-flops and a pair of shorts and a tank top. <laughs> <laughs> we, we take pledges. Ain't, no, take ain't nobody want to see that. Wait, wait, wait. Right. <laughs> <It's, laughs> the, you know, they have, they have creams and ointments for toenails these days, Mike. I mean, well, <laughs> women take care of their toenails. They get pedicures. We don't. Yep. Put your feet back in your shoes, gentlemen. But... <laughs> Part of the other uh, chivalry in media is to dress the part, <clears throat> dress like a knight. You want to be a knight in shining armor? I think you ought to look like one. We have so, said we've said the M word on our show before, and it's been quite controversial. What's the M word? The M word being modesty. <gasps> no, 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 no. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> we all talk about modesty in female dress. That's yes. right. What about modesty in male dress? Good question. 
You what are your both thoughts? Modestly dressed today, I would say. <laughs> I, I try to dress modestly. To me, modestly, modesty just means I'm not offending anyone. I'm not insulting your dignity. And uh, you know, my my friend Colleen Hammond wrote a, a a book every lady should read and give it to, give it to your daughters. It's called Dressing with Dignity. Dressing with Dignity, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so, but we don't have a male equivalent. So, Chivalry and Media advocates for men dressing with dignity. As an example, but I, but I hope to uh, you know form it as a confraternity. And you're not bound, you know, under penalty of per, uh, you know a penalty of a fine or anything. If you take this chivalry and media oath, which we're still working on, um, it would just be one of those, you know, knights should have a bond of honor, a bond of honor. And the bond of honor should be also, uh, you know, let's go back to the trad wars. I rushed to the defense of Joe and Mike when they had been truly injured in the public sphere. That's what a knight does. So it's that code of ethics that where you, where you act like, um, even in your public discourse and the way you conduct yourself publicly, like it actually matters and that there are, and, and we can even say uh, Nicomedian eth- ethics from Aristotle because they're pretty good. You know, St. Thomas Christianized them, but you pretty much get the same ethics. And I'm sorry, in most broadcasting, and that includes Christian and Catholic media, there is not this code of ethics and we need to have it. So that's what it's all about. Tell us about your uh, conversion story, because um, we want to get to know you better. How long have you been Catholic? When did you come uh, into or back into the church? Uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, so I was baptized Catholic when I was two weeks old, right here in New Orleans. And my mother lost her mind and lost the faith. You ever heard the joke about the guy in uh, England? I can't remember who it is, who announced very fam- famously around the time but the Chester Belloc that he was leaving the Catholic Church. And somebody asked him, he said, well, Mr. Gosh, I wish it, w- it wasn't Malcolm Muggeridge, but someone like that. Well, Mr. Former Catholic, you said you're leaving the Catholic Church. So tell all of your readers, what faith is it that you're joining? And he goes, oh, my good man. I said I had left the church, that I had lost my faith. I didn't say I had lost my mind. So, <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so, in other words, he just he left, the, lost the faith, but he, mm. he didn't pick any other up. So, my mother lost her mind. Um, I came back to the church, the Nova Sordo Church, and I don't mean any disrespect by that whatsoever. Um, came back to the New Mass Church in 1992, prior to marrying uh, wife number one. And uh, then uh, after uh, 10 years and a divorce, which probably was should, shouldn't have happened, um, but I can, I can talk a little bit more about that, um, <clears throat> pretty much left the church, fell away. I uh, got remarried in 2005 and uh, in and out of the church, not very faithful, not very good. And then in 2010... Well, 2008, my friend David Simpson ran for Congress, and he started asking me uh, around that time uh, if I was Catholic, and I said, "Yeah, but you know, I, I don't. Go, I, I'm not very good." And he started. Uh, he and I began a very long friendship that exists to this day. As a matter of fact, he's on the Crusade Channel every week, and David um, was the president of the Mysterium Fidei Latin Mass Society here in New Orleans, and around this time in 2010. The bishop had finally just thrown his hands up in the air going, okay, stop bothering me. You're going to have your stupid mass. So he got permission to have the mass here near where I live and started it. And David started inviting me to it. And I didn't go until 2011. And I might have went to one, skipped six weeks, went to another, skipped four weeks, went to another, skipped three weeks, went to another, skipped two weeks, went to another, and went, all right. Either you're all in or you're not. You can't do this. It's a Sunday obligation, I learned. I'll tell you, guys, I never knew that. I never knew that. And really started uh, learning and listening um, to people like Father Philip W., whose name I'm not allowed to pronounce because I do bad things happen to him. So Father Philip W., who um, was a spiritual guide via, uh, via what is today the Census Fidelium site, Steve Cunningham. And... Um, and by, uh, by this time, I'm bringing some of this social teaching to the radio. I meet Brother Andre Marie, 
brother says, you should take this Philosophia Perennis course. And uh, once I started to take it to Mystic Philosophy, it was over. I was all in. And by 2014, there I am on my knees on December the 8th, 2014, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, completing my 33 days of the De Montfort Consecration. Wow. And it's been all uh, downhill since there. Uh, so uh, tell, tell us a little bit about um, your experience coming back to the faith. Um, there's, this, there's this meme that's going around the Internet these days, and I'm a big fan of it. And on one side, it shows this bright and sunny uh, experience. And this woman is saying, you know, this is how I talk about the faith to people who are outside of it and to bring them in. And then on the other side, it's the same woman, but it's like a rainy day. She's wearing a coat. She's like smoking a cigarette. She's saying, this is how I talk about the faith for those who are inside the church. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience from 2014 coming in December 8th and, and making your De Montford um, consecration. And what your thoughts have, have been and what your experience has been in these last six years? Well, it's been largely a, uh, a phenomenally good one. And um, anyone out there that's watching that has not done a Marian consecration and has not taken up the, uh, to be place, place yourself humbly under the mantle of Our Lady, um, my experience, you're missing out on something. Uh, which is not to say that sacred heart devotions and what have you, um, that you can't get the same thing or, you know, great graces out of that. It's not me saying that. But there's just something about having a supernatural, wonderful mother as we do in Our Lady. Um, my experience has been largely um, just thrilling, unexpected. I've met people from all around the world. I've been to a conference in France, so I went to the Vendée. I have done a pilgrimage in England. I've done the uh, the Walsingham pilgrimage. As a matter of fact, I'll just reach over here real quick. She that is Our Lady of Walsingham. Our Lady of Walsingham. Now, I just read a piece about her. Um, this was this was one of the most famous pilgrimage sites in all of England. Uh, tell us about Our Lady of Walsingham. Well, so um, she sits right here on my desk. And I, um, <clears throat> I was going to go on this trip with Regina Magazine and Beverly Stevens to England. And my wife and I had committed to it. And before we, did, before we went, I decided I was going to bring my broadcasting gear, and I did a bunch of shows. So we did 16 shows, vignettes, podcasts, etc., from various locations in England. One of them was from Walsingham. So I knew that I was going on uh, one day of the Walsingham pilgrimage. So I asked my friend, Joseph Pierce, the author, if he would do a show, because he knew a lot about Walsingham, uh, if he would do a show with me. And we called it All Roads Lead to Walsingham. So um, about that time, Joseph had told me of, of a couple of small uh, miracles that happened to him. Conversion, back to, or to the faith, number one, in Walsingham. And number two, his wife saying yes to be his wife in Walsingham. So he, Joseph suggested that I, uh, 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 that piece of equipment that I was telling you about that I brought to London, I didn't have it when we had decided to go on a trip. So I did a nine-day novena to Our Lady of Walsingham. I needed to raise six grand and, and to get this piece of equipment. And I said, uh, if you will help me here, I will start a devotion to you. And I will go to Walsingham, and I will broadcast, and then I will I will tape record and do and do what I did. Um, on the last day of the novena, and I did this publicly on the radio show on the Crusade Channel. On the last day, now no one knew it was the last day, and no one other than Joseph Pearson, uh, my wife, Mrs. Chur, no one knew that the nine days of the novena were up. It was a Friday, and I got up that morning and go like, well. We only got halfway there, so uh, I guess I'll figure out some kind of way. But we still have today, Mother, so did my novena prayer. And that day, on the ninth day, almost at the 11th hour, two donations came in that put me over the top. So I was able to buy the equipment, and uh, we still use it today. 
and take it to, to England and uh, go to Wolsey and, and broadcast. And here's a kicker. Joseph Pierce told me in the All Roads Lead to Walsingham, he said, oh, M- Michael, you can have a devotion to Our Lady of Walsingham, uh, and you can have a novena and ask her for things, but just know that she's going to always make you wait to the, to the last minute. <laughs> Uh, you, you, and I had forgotten. You completely about that. nailed that accent. Yeah, by that the was way. good. Yeah, we like, like that. I, 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 That's I Joseph Pierce. Joseph Pierce. Personally. Uh, was he? How, did he dial in or something? Yeah. Or? <laughs> okay. So so now tell us, uh, Our Lady of Walsingham. For those who don't know, this was a small chapel, and Walsingham's like in the north of England. Is that right? It is north and east of where. If you're looking at London, go north. And then go a little east, and that's where Wall. It's in the Shire. And now, th- now there was an image of Our Lady. There was a statue, and during you know those Protestants are so nice to us, uh, Catholics. We just Joseph and I just did a show about the English Reformation and how awful ah. it was. Um, now, Our Lady of Walsingham, uh, I think the original statue was was burned or something. Or do you, do you know the story of that? Totally. So in twelve uh, eighteen. There is a woman named Rochelle Dees, and she is visited by Our Lady, who's carrying her child. And she says, I have a great love for all the holy people and the great kings of England, and I wish for a chapel to be built on this spot so that a pilgrimage to uh, to uh, my, sa- my, my uh, I can't remember she said a macro. She wouldn't have said a macro hard then. So that, it, that this can be a pilgrimage site. And so all the great kings of England can come and visit this chapel. So Rochelle Dees um, began to start try to pick a, a location out. And in the middle of the night, and, and she didn't find one, because she went and said, well, I think it ought to be on this hill where I was standing. And a guy that was going to build it go, no, no, you can't build it there. She, he, uh, she wouldn't want it there. It, it, it's this and then the other. So in the middle of the night, Our Lady said, oh, yeah, watch this. So Our Lady built a small chapel there overnight, miraculously. And they all woke up and bam the next day, there's the, the, the chapel. So on that spot, they built this magnificent 180-foot-tall chapel. It was almost a football field long. And it is, uh, is one of the most magnificent chapels. Uh, uh, to uh, dedicate it to Our Lady anywhere in all of Europe. This becomes one of the great pilgrimages, the pilgrimage to Walsingham. Henry VIII does the pilgrimage. And he's one, and, and the, the tradition of the pilgrimage is you take your shoes off and you walk the last mile barefoot. So at the Protestant, uh, the, at the English uh, Reformation, which was not a, a Reformation at all, it was a destruction. Uh, during the, the Henry VIII destruction of Catholicism, yes, the Protestants burned the statue. They actually took it down, um, and Rochelle Dees gave directions on how the statue was to be made. The color of the cloak, the color of the crown, which arm our Lord would be sitting in, what would he have in his hand. You know, you could see uh, there's uh, there's many uh, uh, parts to this. There are the, uh, on the, on the throne, you can see there's seven rings. It's the seven sacraments. There's just all kind of just wonderful uh, iconography in this that is, is in the statue. She was wood, and she was destroyed. She was taken down to London and publicly immolated. That means burned. Yeah. Um, when the faith was restored and the prim- supremacy uh, laws were repealed in 1836, a woman was visited again by Our Lady and was told, rebuild my statue. And she goes out, and there were paintings of it. And this is what we have here today as Our Lady of Walls. Wow. wow. And now the chapel has been, now the old chapel is, is not there. I mean, it's still in just the, just the ruins of it that you can see on the internet. But um, the new chapel, called the Slipper Chapel, is where the new statue of Our Lady of Walls in him is. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, okay, so Mike, back back to your, your mission itself, right? So you've got the Mike Church Show. What else do you have? You mean on the channel? Yes, all, all together, right? The, the the entire the entire mission. Tell tell us a little bit about that, just kind of at a thirty foot uh, view, if you will. Okay, so we have our own news uh, news team, and we do news uh, four times a day. It's our own Crusade Channel news, um, and it's not farmed out from anyone else. It's not picked up from wire services and what have you. It's our own news, 
And uh, we do we do it kind of different. <clears throat> so our newscast features the saint of the day and usually a quote from the saint of the day or the quote of uh, the quote of the day. Um, but it has all the other secular elements in it that you would expect from a newscast. So, again, what did Vatican II say? Sanctify the temporal sphere. Get out there and poke the evil guys right in the face and get in their face and compete with them. So we have news. We have the Mike Church show. We have Richard Barrett, who does a three-hour show every day called The Barrett Brief. And uh, this is a show that covers business, culture, faith, um, and it, it's a fast-paced format. Uh, I think people will really like it. And then we have weekly shows. I mentioned Brother Andre Marie, Brother Andre Marie and uh, Reconquest Radio. Uh, Brothers, by the way, has now done 215 episodes of Reconquest on the Crusade Channel. 215. We have, uh, and they've covered, you name the part of the faith you want to talk about, Brother Andre Marie has covered it from the St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire, and the Slaves to the Immaculate Heart. We have the True Money Show, which is every weekday from 3 to 5, and that's and that's a, uh, <clears throat> now you wouldn't know it, He's giving you finances through a Catholic lens. But he doesn't ever say that. And uh, he's giving you financial advice and how to live in this usury-laden society of ours and not sin with your money. So we have the True Money Show. Uh, we've just added rules for retrogrades with our friends Tim and David Gordon. Uh, we have a new show coming on. There's two guys out of New Jersey. These two guys out of New Jersey, and they talk like this. And you think, hey, who are these guys out the <laughs> Sopranos? <laughs> are they in the Joe garbage business by chance, or are they or the transportation business? <laughs> They're not in the sanitation or transportation. Okay, business. wow. All okay. right, so All we're right. safe. Okay, yeah, good. Joe and Joe are, uh, are awesome. And then at night, we have um, we run old school mystery radio. So now, I've heard some of this stuff. This stuff is fantastic. You're, like, oh, yeah, resurrecting, totally. like, cool old-time radio uh, shows about, you know, various different things. Yes. So, at night, we run old-time mystery radio. On weekends, on Saturdays, we do a lot of best-of stuff. You know, and some of the old-time mystery radio, uh, the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone and uh, uh, Nigel Bruce. Um we run uh, one of the most popular old-time radio dramas ever, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, America's uh, insurance insurance adjuster or investigator. There's uh, 900 episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. CBS Radio Mystery Theater, which ran for 1,400 and some odd episodes, hosted by the, uh, the great E.G. Marshall. And if you don't know who E.G. Marshall is, Watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase. <laughs> right. <laughs> Art, Art, the grandpa, that's E.G. Marshall. So it's one of the last films that he made. Tell and us, then on tell Sundays, us. we turn it over to sermons. And we, we it's all sermons all day. No commercials, no interruptions. Um, and we play talks from Brother Andre and talks from Michael Davies, the people whose record, a voice you'd recognize on Sunday. That's the most Catholic it gets on Sunday. But again... We don't. We just say our priests. We don't work on. We don't work on Sundays, but our priests do. So that's a that's as close as we get to being a, a Catholic station, and that airs publicly. You don't have to be a member. Anyone, uh, anyone in the world can listen to it at CrusadeChannel.com. Okay, so ha tell us a little bit about the stress of running a station where you've got to be broadcasting something at all times. I mean, do, do you ever sleep? <laughs> Uh, sometimes. Yeah, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the difficult part is, is in organizing and planning. So you plan for the worst, protect the downside. Now I'll give you a Trumpism from art of the deal, protect the Trump, uh, the downside and the upside will take care of its, of itself. So the first thing that we plan for is dead air generated by us from the broadcasting source. And uh, it took us three years to get basically that. It took us another year and a half to perfect it. And uh, we're in our fifth year now, and we've just gotten some of these things worked out. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot of stress because people are demanding and they want things right now. They don't want them in, a, in an hour. <laughs> and um, 
people want things. We also run a store, so people want things delivered and they want sh uh, free shipping. They want immediate service. And what we tell them is, look, we represent artisans, handmade artisan guys mostly. Uh, we are not Amazon. If you want Amazon, then you should probably go to Amazon. Although I don't think anyone should ever go to Amazon again. Um, so after five years, we've learned to manage many of the challenges that would stress you out and freak you out. Um, but you know what? The gremlins are always there and the demons are always looking for an opportunity to throw monkey wrenches into our work. So um, there are many days where, you know, and you're covering a live event like the sham impeachment that we just all went through. I was sleeping four or five hours a day because, you know, I'm covering doing the show, helping with the news gathering and doing sometimes eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 hours a day of covering uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, this ridiculous, this embarrassing spectacle of this coup that the Democrats tried to pull to uh, undo the election of 2019 and, and impeach our president, which, by the by, by the time you watch this next week, will have failed miserably. Yeah, I saw a meme on the internet the other day, and it was a picture of Nancy Pelosi's face. Which in itself is just difficult to look Repulsive. at. Repulsive. But, but she was making she was making a rather sad uh, demeanor, and it said, "The face you make when in the same week your city loses the Super Bowl and your impeachment bid fails." <laughs> 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 I mean, that's like that's like double whammy for that woman. I saw that one, and um, she you know she claims to be Catholic. Um, I've watched enough. And I've got TVs all around the studio. We're monitoring news yeah. from several places. So, unfortunately, I see Winebox Nancy, as I call her. I see Winebox Nancy often. And there's no denying that she's either got some mental condition going on or she's drunk. One of the two. Well, she, yeah. call, she calls Trump Bush every other day. I, I'm she, sorry. I, I have to interject here. That those two are not mutually exclusive. I, it made it sound like that's that they true. were. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah, good I point, Mike. Yeah, let's re-examine the logic on that one. <laughs> so, so you you do you do live commentary every day on your channel about the political happenings and this witch hunt around President Trump, who, by the way, is the most pro-life president we've had in the history of this republic, without a doubt. And I'll tell you something else that we do. That um, now let's go back to the chivalry in media and to what the crusade is. And the crusade is this. Look, if I open up the New York Times or the Boston Globe or the Kansas City Star or any major newspaper, if there is a controversy where a Catholic priest or a church can be impugned, maligned, made fun of, say, see there, see the Catholic church, see what they do, they're going to write about it. People are going to editorialize about it. They're going to say and write things that are going to be uh, insulting to people that are actually practicing the faith. So what we just established here is that in secular media, it is perfectly fine and normal these days to do these things and to basically incriminate and heap calumny and scandal upon the church and upon church men, and then by extension and by proxy to me and to you. But apparently, it makes you some sort of, uh, well, you shouldn't be doing it. It makes you some sort of an outlier. Um, if you do the opposite, and you go, like, well, I'm going to approach the same subject, but let me look at it from the point of view that, uh, well, the church is not evil. Are there bad men, evil men in her? Yes. Why? Because of the fall. Stupid, look it up. Or, or can bad things happen? Yeah. See Judas. Uh <laughs> Can, can can popes and bishops go bad? Uh, yeah, read some history. But it still needs to be covered. And no one in secular media will do the covering. They won't cover, and they won't cover something as simple as, you know, why do we oppose uh, our children being taught how to perform homosexual acts and other sex acts when they're 12? Is it because well, they're usurping our secular, our power as parent? That's the secular answer. Uh, how about the Catholic answer, which also is could, could be just the good answer? It's a mortal sin. It's a bad thing to do. Kind of guarantees you a glide path into hell. And I don't think we should teach children that. So you take the opportunity when there's something like that that can be talked about, and you go into their world, go right into their world, 
walk right up to their doorstep and punch them right in the face with the faith. Now, you can do it without saying, I just did a Catholic thing to you. I can use natural law and philosophy to do it. And I do the exact same thing. Yeah. That's what we should be doing. So uh, for, for those who are listening to the show or watching it on YouTube, many of the Orthodox and traditional and conservative Catholics who are subscribers to this channel are probably, they probably vote Republican in, in these United States, at least for our American audience. And I, I suspect many of them do listen to terrestrial radio, Mike, and some of them might not be familiar with you as an alternative to that. Um, but, you know, when you think about the big names, and I won't ask you to name names, but I'll name them. In terrestrial radio, you've got Rush Limbaugh, who just announced he's suffering from uh, stage four lung cancer. Uh, you have Sean Hannity, Mark Levin. You've got these titans of terrestrial radio, none of whom are Catholic, and many of whom would agree with us on a natural law level for some of these uh, some of these topics. But what what is your thought on how uh, the Crusade Channel competes uh, with that market, and um, and and you know? And, and can bring viewers and listeners um, away from that market? Well, I think we compete very well with them, and I think that the natural law point of view can be applied to almost everything. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't think of anything it can't be applied to. But let's go back to G.K. Chesterton. What did Chesterton say? What do you mean you don't want to talk about religion and politics? What else is there to talk about other than religion and politics? So... Again, this idea that we run away like screaming little schoolgirls from the, 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 the topic of religion because, well, there's things you don't discuss at parties. One of them is abortion and the other is religion. Well, that's just silliness. Religion is important. Um, and, and as I just gave the example, the same people some of you describe, Sean Hannity has gotten in fights on the Sean Hannity show with good priests over contraception. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. a counterpoint of view, and the only place that you might get that is today. Now, let me just give you a couple of figures that do kind of have that natural law angle. And the only people worth watching on Fox News anymore, I'm sorry, Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson. Now, Tucker's a high Episcopalian, as I understand it. Mm. Correct. Um, but I listen to Tucker and I go like, that dude's a Catholic. Yeah, he's, he a, he's a Catholic, Catholic in waiting. Things. Yeah, he's a yeah. Catholic in waiting for sure. No, it's, uh, totally, totally. As a matter of fact, guys, there's a piece on my website. Uh, the coming, con the coming conversion of Tucker Carlson, um, because he, he, he speaks when he speaks his mind, he's talking about usury. You yeah. know, his famous, uh, January the 8th monologue last year, he's talking about usury. Yeah. Um, so how do we compete? Now, 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 now this is, a, is, is something, the idea that you can't do things, you can't cover politics. Can I cover the president from my point of view? Well, I'm not going to ring every day. I'm not going to go like, well, Trump didn't go to mass today, and I didn't hear him saying a rosary, so he, he's not Catholic as far as I'm concerned. I'm not even going to talk about that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk about when he does get to the good, the true, and beautiful, and he defends it. When he marches down the street and goes to the March for Life and gives an address that Leo the Thirteenth could have done, I'm going to say a pope could have given, a bishop could have given that address. Gosh, what a shame we don't have a pope or a bishop that will give that address today. Sure. That's that. So can I say that in a secular setting? Can I say in advance to my friends out there who are not Catholic or are Christians or evangelicals, maybe you're not practicing any faith at all. I think that this is applicable to you guys, and I think that you'll be interested if you'll hear me out. So is can we bridge the gap? Absolutely we can yeah, bridge the yeah. gap. Now you no, brought up you brought up Laura Ingram, and uh, everyone should acknowledge the fact that she is Catholic, and uh, she's responsible for bringing Raymond Arroyo out of the obscurity of EWTN and into the mainstream of uh, Fox News, right? Yeah. Um, now let's go back to to Rush. Rush is a very natural law, physical natural law guy, which is why he gets a lot of things: the good, true, and the beautiful. He gets a lot of things in a Thomistic sense. He gets them right because his logical brain is working correctly. Imagine if Limbaugh took an actual course like the one Taylor Marshall took uh, in Thomistic philosophy. Imagine Rush as a real Thomistic philosopher and then as a convert. Well, you know what Laura Ingram did yesterday? She said on her Twitter feed, I am praying the rosary for Rush. 
and prayer warriors across the country are very active, meaning, meaning she was encouraging. Yeah. You know what I did? Now, let's go back to the solidarity trad wars. I went behind Laura and I said, I joined at Ingram Angle and praying the rosary because I did it this morning and asking for Our Lady to give Rush a little, a little healing help. And I also prayed that if he needs it for his conversion to the, uh, uh, to the faith. Now, that's, she's a very public person. And I know Rush loves her because he's been on her show. She's interviewed him. Yeah. So I know. Now, you just took an opportunity to, again, add a little Catholicism to what you do. We shouldn't be ashamed of this. This idea that we have to cordon ourselves off in this Catholic media so that we can do and say Catholic things is ridiculous. You know what it is? It's the clown car cop out. That's why, go back to the beginning of the show, why I left the trad wars. Okay, now, uh, you're, you've talked a little bit about the trad wars and how it's, it's difficult for a ca- for, you know, to present an argument on secular politics from the point of view of a Roman Catholic. Why, why Mike, do you think that so many Catholics are afraid to commentate on secular politics from their point of view? Uh, what, what happened in this country to sideline all the legitimate Catholic voices? Why, why do we feel like we have to speak uh, in hushed tones and from the shadows? Uh, that's a f- fantastic question. <clears throat> remember the, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember his name now. Father Patrick, uh, gosh, the rosary uh, priest. He, and his name, his last name escapes me, but it's 1950s. Um, it's a good Irish name. He bought airtime through mutual uh, broadcasting. So he, he was buying an hour at a time. And he would do a broadcast, and a mutual, uh, 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 mutual broadcasting system would tell him, Father, you could say anything you want, but you can't say rosary. Gave him two words you couldn't say. So did Father say, well, if I can't say rosary, then I'm going to retreat to my own channel. No. He played by their rules and said, okay, was well, there a way around that? You know how he got around it? Guess, guess how we got around it. Uh, um, good question. I don't know. <laughs> he bought commercials for his rosary rallies. Oh, that's funny. He bought really? commercials from mutual broadcasting, probably Westwood One, and aired them during the commercial breaks during the show. That's how we got around it. Okay. That, wow. That's, that's somebody who's committed to the faith and, and willing to do what it takes. So, uh, so why are they afraid? Well, number one, they think that the world, uh, they believe in this, uh, this Protestantized notion that the world has rejected Catholicism. That is just simply not true. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go out on a limb to say it is impossible for the world to reject Catholicism because the author of Catholicism created the world. <laughs> so good luck with rejecting it. Um, and uh, to, to why they're afraid, well, I, I could just give a couple of examples. Can I talk about what's happening in Congress? And can I give you a, uh, a, a truly authentic Catholic point of view on it? Yes, I can. I can say, Congressman Scalise, my congressman, it is immoral for you to tax me any more than you already have. And to, and, and to, and to continue to tax me, um, um, cause you're not really taxing me. You're taxing people that aren't even alive. In, in, in fact, you uh, owe me a rebate. <laughs> yes. You're, you're committing theft on people on, on my children. Yeah, it's or multi-generational theft. I mean, I mean, scripture says render to Caesar. What is due to Caesar? How can you possibly conclude that Caesar is owed more than what is owed to God? Can I, I and here's the fundamental way that we can talk Catholicism in a secular world and not even have to say the C word, okay? You talked about the M word earlier. Don't even have to say the C word. <laughs> you, you can talk about subsidiarity. The founders of the Constitution talked basically about subsidiarity. And sure. by the by, the Electoral College is a direct ripoff of the College of Cardinals. There can be no <laughs> doubt that the College of Cardinals is taken from the, uh, the, the Electoral College is taken from the College of Cardinals. You know, it, it, it's, it's, the, funny, it's funny that you say that, Mike, because I, I often make the comparison to the contrary. 
Uh, but of course, th- these things come full circle. Now it seems that the the church is imitating American politics. Well, the reason I say that it's taken from the College of Cardinals because the Electoral College sets up a system of subsidiarity and a hierarchy. Okay, you're electing a president, pope. Um, who's electing him? People that are popes? No, popes can't elect popes. Who's electing him? People that are appointed for the task. Who are they? Well, in the church, cardinals. Who are they in the electoral college? Electors, okay? Is there a process by which uh, an elector is made an elector, and does it require uh, uh, the Pope or the Holy Father, or in this instance, the president? Well, in some instances, yes. President could, by uh, virtue uh, of campaigning, could have some influence on who an elector is and who an elector is not. Um, And it's a direct system of subsidiarity because you have the levels and the hierarchies, right? You have the hierarchy, hierarchy, hierarchy. So it is, it is, it, and it may not be an exact copy, yeah. but it's in keeping with it. Sure. But the system of subsidiarity, Congressman Scalise, we do not need to have Louisiana's roads paved by the government of the United States. So, we should be paving them in Maine. There are yeah, roads. That's federalism. Yeah. So, subsidiarity. Yeah. So you can and that and that is right out of St. King Louis the Ninth. Solidarity and subsidiarity. You know, President Obama stumbled on the solidarity once in in his uh, in his campaigning when he and he said, "Well, it is true. I am my brother's keeper." Well, you know, for once you got it right. Yeah. You are. Yeah. Even a broken, stupid, drunk, uh, homosexual clock can be right every now and then. Well, I wasn't talking about Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> 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 but 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 Mike, you're, you're you're talking about the principle of subsidiarity. So just so our our viewers, could you could you uh, state what that uh, what the principle of subsidiarity is, so that we're not getting confused between uh, that and socialist concepts of subsidizing and, everything. And and again, part of the and, and I've done a lot of work here in history. I've written several movies about the time of the founding and drafting of the Constitution and, and the uh, Declaration of Independence. So I study the founding uh, founding fathers, and uh, know a little bit about how that what how they thought, and you know they weren't they were a lot closer to Luther's break than we are. That's one thing, but the system of subsidiarity had been pretty much had been kept in some in, at, at some at some level, and Thomas Jefferson even writes in one of his more famous letters that he did not believe that it would be effective to try and govern a society of men uh, in, uh, uh, outside the scale of a New England township. Now, Jefferson was not a Catholic by any means. Um, so what could he possibly have been talking about? Well, guys, he was talking about a parish. This is what used to be called, and we should get back to calling, republicanism. So the system of subsidiarity says that nothing should be done outside a community or a locality. Nothing should be done or exercised upon it politically or practically that they are incapable of doing themselves. Now, that covers almost everything. That covers an awful lot. And, you know, when you, when, 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 when you think about it, when you think about the road, um, can you build a bridge over the Mississippi River if you're just the city of New Orleans? Well, Maybe, but I think that the state benefits from it, the entire state. As a matter of fact, I think that you know states that use the same road to get across the river and maybe want tra- uh, train traffic to go over might benefit from it. Is there a case that can be made that you know you, you get to this next levels of subsidiarity, just to use the example of the Huey Long Bridge here in New Orleans, which has vehicular traffic and train traffic on it. Is that something that you would go above the local level uh, of subsidiarity. Well, yes, it is. And again, it's common sense. So the system of subsidiarity just says what you can do locally that you should do. And basically, under the the, the, the system that was set up uh, by the Articles of Confederation uh, after 1781, and then by the Constitution after 1789, basically relies on a system of, of republicanism of subsidiarity that, thanks to nationalism, fake patriotism, and jingoism, and Catholics being too afraid to go into the public, 
to talk about this is almost completely lost, guys. Almost, it, it, it exists in our hearts. We know it. We know, we, you know, we know we can just, we can describe it. We can define it. Yeah. Um, but you don't see it in action a lot. So we got a lot of work to do to get back to living in and rebuilding our towns. You know, kind of like what's going on. Uh, you guys are in the Kansas uh, City area. Kind of like what's going on just north of you in St. Mary's. Um, what's going on in, in, in another place uh, not too far from you, in Gower, Missouri, in St. Joseph, Missouri. There are little towns out there that are you know, starting to carve that little niche out there. And good priests are being called. Lay, uh, you know, consecrated orders of sisters and brothers are, you know, are being called there. So you know, I think that there's every reason to be, uh, no, not to be sanguine, but to be hopeful about the future um, and about that system of subsidiarity. But the first place we should practice subsidiarity is in our houses. If you can't get it right there, you got no shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. You brought up Jeffersonian uh, federalism. And one of the other things that Jefferson is famous for is defining the so-called separation of church and state. What do you think about that? Well, the letter that he wrote in 1803 to the Danbury Baptist Church is a farce. He did not establish a, a separation of church and state. But let's just get to the part. Should we have a separation of church and state? Well, God already told us that we should. What are the two perfect societies? Church and state. Why are they perfect? Because contained in them is everything that is necessary for their continuation. Okay? So you should have a separate church and state. Here's where Jefferson gets off the course, though, and is wrong. If there's a conflict between separation of the church, between the church and the state, and I believe the church and state should be working together, hand in glove. If there's a conflict between the church and the state, who prevails? Well, what Mike and Joe and what Mike say is the church. What the secular Sean Hannity world says today is the state. That is wrong. That is a horrible, grievous error, and it needs to be called out. That that does not mean that we live in a Sharia law. I hear, I'm not living in your theocracy. Oh, but we live in the theocracy of homo right now, right? We yeah, sure. I mean, we, we live in a secular theocracy. Totally. Absolutely. So, but the, the, the when you say should the church prevail, okay, can we all agree that murder is should be illegal? Yeah. All right. Well, you could say that's natural law, but that's also a commandment. The church has just prevailed. Can we all agree that stealing, again, a commandment? Well, okay, well, that's the that's religion prevailing, whether you like it or not. Can we all agree? Uh, can we get back to making adultery illegal again? Well, that's not only the uh, the um, the commandments prevailing. That's also our Lord. You know, if a well, man I, had to be with a how about private a, property? I mean, how about the how about the principle of, of of personal property and ownership of things? I mean, this is a commandment, and this is really one of the foundations of Western civilization, which is being lost today in the you know secular socialist communist realm. Right, and one of the great organizations that's out there that's fighting uh, for this, and I I, I like the uh, uh, the paintings of the kings and St. Thomas behind you guys, um, is my friends at the Tradition Family and Property, uh, the TFP. Um, and note, tradition, family, property. What's missing in every socialist, communist country in the world? Property, private property. What's mentioned where there is human misery and suffering almost everywhere where you see it, especially when it's caused by government, private property. Um, and when somebody says, where's private property in the Catholic Church? Well, first of all, popes have pronounced on it. That's one thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Se- Rerum Navarum, all, the, you shall not steal. That's right. Second of all, the commandment, thou shalt not steal. Mm-hmm. Steal what? Someone else's property. Well, and, and and why and why is this so important, Mike? Right, because with regards to property, we we talk about the necess- necessity. Aristotle talks about it in Nicomachean Ethics, as an example, that we are stewards of the, this property that is given to us. Right, so we have a responsibility before God to take care of what He has given us. He didn't give, you know, what he gave to me, he didn't give to Mike. What's mine is mine, and what's Mike's is Mike's. That's right. There's a reason, like you say, there's a commandment about it. But that's not fair. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, you know that 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 ties into a whole nother conversation. I mean, I that that vest of yours with the with the bone buttons. It's mine. Why can't I have one? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 th- th- this all all property, of course, is God's, and to say that it is my property, like we would say colloquially, if you will, um, it's important because this is my responsibility before God to tend to that He gave me to take care of and to do good with. Well, and and this is why you have uh, prohibitions um, against abortions. And this is why you have prohibitions and laws, and you should have them, against against public knowledge or acts of juvenile, carnal knowledge, as it's called. You know, back in the day, before the, the sex revolution, sodomy was illegal in all 50 states. That, that that is a that is management of 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 a human property there. There are all manners of law uh, that uphold property and can kind of define some property as being you can use it for this and some property you can't. And people say that well prostitution ought to be it ought to be legal because we can tax it. Well, no, it shouldn't be because it promotes a sin. Again, when there's a conflict between the church and the state, the the church must prevail. Church says no prostitution. Get over yourself. Now, yeah, but you're still going to be prostitutes. Well, there's a prohibition against murder, and our Lord was still sacrificed. So there are going to be sins. You just have to deal with it. But yeah, absolutely. Promote, protect, and defend property. Now, the principal reason why you need to protect property is because you are going to raise a family you're going to make a home. You can only make truly a, 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 a home wh- where you're practicing subsidiarity and solidarity when you own it. Mm. It's yours. The family owns it. So the family and the family dwelling, that is property. Yeah. You know, people look at the house. You know, why'd you buy that house? Because it's going to increase the value. Now you can sell it and buy another one and get a bigger car. Uh, I bought a house because it rained last night. I didn't want to sleep in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you didn't want to thank the government for your for your house I, uh, <laughs> uh, mike i hate to inform you you didn't build that someone else made that happen for you oh that's right i forgot pocahontas you didn't build that <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> oh wow okay one other one other embellishment that i you, you mentioned it you dropped it and we we can't just let it go we have to ask you to uh to uh, elaborate on it. You said that folks are talking about usury. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on usury and the exchange of money and interest rates and all that. Um, oh, are you a distributist, by the way? Oh, I'm sorry. I just asked that question. Wow. You said the D word. <laughs> we got a lot. Of, we got C's and D's and M's. Yeah. And... Here, I'll try to do it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I made a D on my forehead. Oh wow! For, I am a, I bless me, Father, for I've sinned. I am a distributist. What does that mean? Can you please just enlighten us? Because so many people have different definitions of it. I can't wrap it, my head around it. It it, it means in a uh, solidarity and subsidiarity based distribution of goods and services and wealth. Um, it does not mean that you confiscate all the property and then you divvy it up. Although, I re- people say, that's socialism. I reject that. Uh, if you have for the purpose of seeing to it that every man has the three acres and the three cows and that um, um, you're, that you would, you were going to set a, a civilization up, and if it's agreed to in a very small scale that that's what you want to do, Well, then that's no different than dividing up lots in a subdivision these days, Um, except you're just doing it for a different reason. I think the right reason. So a distributist is basically practicing subsidiarity and solidarity, and he's not practicing usury. He's also, you know, the chivalry and media thing that we talked about earlier. I didn't elaborate enough on the vocation part. Why don't we do what we do? It used to be that people did what they did, uh, practice whatever skill. They did it as a vocation, as a calling. Uh, they didn't do it for just the pure uh, accumulation of wealth. 
So in a system of, distrib- of, 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 di- uh, 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 of being distributist, um, and I think that it's an awful term because it's got so much baggage with it. So why don't we just say, okay, you know, you're distributist? Yeah. What does that mean? I practice subsidiarity, solidarity, and I do all I can to stay out of the system of usury, which is very difficult to do because they've made our currency usury based. So what do you do? Well, you encourage people, number one. Now, we all understand that some people just don't have a vocation. They don't have a skill, and if they do, they can't go to work for themselves. Um, In those instances, what I would say is, well, try and find something that you could do so that you are in control of your destiny. You know, this idea of working for the man, this is a min- this is an invention. This is a new paradigm that came about through the Industrial Revolution. There is no record and no part of the historical record where men worked for the man and left their houses for long periods of time to go and all in and, and such mass quantities and worked for the man. So in a system of, of, of distributism, you're going to be working at something that you want to do and that you love doing and that you could support your family doing it, but you're principally doing it one for the love of doing it. Because, you know, we do get things out of our work other than wealth. You know, you, can, you there, 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 there can be mortifications in your work. Offer it up, right? There can be uh, common sense lessons that you can learn daily in your work, right? Learn from it. There could be opportunities to practice charity in your work. Well, then you should do that. It's almost impossible to do that inside the corporate setting for today. So being a distributist would be, to me, seeking uh, seeking the good, the true, and the beautiful. In yeah, And we should stop calling it work. It's not work. It's a vocation. It's a calling. You know, the word work is a word. That's a, that's a term that communists use. Communists use terms like work. We're not communists. You know, if we had to describe it, we could uh, we could, we could call it labor, right? Ora et labora. So we will have to put on pretty good authority that that one's okay. So it would be getting back to the to to the land where possible, and if not. No, you, we don't all have to become agrarians. Somebody's going to come out, this guy thinks we all should become agrarians. No, we need people that can deal with 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 uh, financials. We need people that can build things. Uh, we need people that can maintain roads. And in some instances, you're going to have to get the state involved. And you're going to have to have maybe a, a department of transportation. Um, do you have to have one where the rules are set uh, above where the people that actually work in uh, and, and, and take the benefit from the, uh, uh, from the work, you know, that's a system of, dis- of, 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 of distributism. This has been perhaps the most wide-ranging interview that we've had on Full Disclosure, <laughs> Joseph. We had planned on four questions. We got, we got many more in. We talked about new media, the Crusade Channel, wine box Pelosi, natural law, monarchy, distributism, republicanism, private property, and the Von Day. If you like Mike Church's show, if you like uh, what you're hearing, check him out. Uh, tell us about your channel. Give us the website. Give us everything. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay, so the easiest way to, to start listening to the Crusade Channel is to sign up for a 30-day free membership, which would give you access to everything that we do, or well, most things that we do, and it's free for 30 days. So you get the full run of the service. So just go to crusadechannel.com forward slash go. It's crusadechannel.com forward slash go. And uh, if you're on social media, follow me on social media. I'm pretty easy to find, at the King Dude on Twitter, and uh, Mike Church Show uh, on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel, the official Mike Church, uh, official Mike Church show. Um, but I would say, and on my own website, personal website, where you'll find the Chivalry and Media, our confraternity, the Crusader Knights of the Most Holy Rosaries, something that we didn't talk about, but c- kind of goes in hand with the Chivalry and Media. All that's on my site at MikeChurch.com. So th- those, I'm hiding in plain sight, gentlemen. 
<laughs> well, thank you, uh, Miguel Iglesias, Mike Church. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This is Full Disclosure. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks so much, sir. We appreciate your time. God bless you.